there are certain stories you hear that make you feel a little humble and recognize just the privileged situation you are in. Most of the time on this channel, I concentrate on the cultural differences between England, stroke the UK and Germany. Now in this one, I'm going to look at the similarities and why integration into German society for me was pretty easy. Mahlzeit! Welcome back! Richie here again. Thank you very much for joining me and as I said in the, in the introduction I'm going to be looking at the similarities between my home country of England and the UK and Germany rather than the differences and also go on to make the argument that really integration into German society wasn't that difficult for me and it really shouldn't have been compared to others in a much less fortunate situ situation. On this channel I have a lot of very kind viewers and I receive a lot of nice comments, lots of compliments, particularly complimenting on my standard of German, saying that I speak very good German, also complimenting me on the way that I have fully integrated and become part of German society. And it's fine, don't get me wrong, I'm very very proud of what I've achieved and I'm very happy to, to hear these compliments, it's very very nice of you, but Let's get real for a minute. Let's look at the similarities of our cultures and our countries and really, you know, admit it, it shouldn't be that difficult, should it? Now, first of all, then, what are the similarities that our two countries share? Well, let's start with my favourite subject, language. We look at this, um, for instance, the family tree of languages, of Indo-European languages. First of all, our languages, the German and the English language, modern English, modern Hochdeutsch, are both of course Indo-European languages and not only that they are on the branch the big branch of Germanic languages yes we share a completely common root of languages the English language comes from the German languages the Germanic languages uh, we all have this in common here the Nordic languages the Dutch language you can see here just how closely they are related on this diagram so when you look at the bigger picture then and consider that there are also a whole load of Semitic languages for instance the Arabic uh, the Asian languages Chinese Japanese all these other languages that have completely different alphabets and the English and the German languages really are so close I mean, I've never taken a, a, a Dutch lesson in my life, a life, um, a language lesson in in Dutch, and just basically through being a Germanic speaker, an English and a German speaker, I can understand so much Dutch, uh, even listening to it and certainly seeing it written down. We have so much in common. We really have very, very, very similar languages. Again, another point on which we like to concentrate on the differences, and this is going to strike a controversial chord with many of you uh, no doubt but the climate the climate in the UK and here in Germany is very very similar come on look at the map and you'll see that the UK is pretty much on the same longitude with with you know most of northern Germany and don't come with the old saying oh in England it's always raining it's always raining in England and no, England is immer am regnen because believe me I spent six months living in Schleswig-Holstein and it was the wettest six months of my life I swear to God it rained every single day uh, for at least 10 hours you can look it up on the records it was 1999 it was January to June July of 1999 look up the records it will see you'll find there were four cubic meters every hour of rain in every place of Schleswig-Holstein <laughs> It rained a lot. It rained much more than I'd ever, ever experienced in my whole time in the UK. Our climates are very similar. Really, really they are. And as a result of this similar climate, we also, of course, have a very similar Northern European flora and fauna. The crops we grow, the animals that live in our, our countries are very similar. And because of that, we, of course, have a very, very similar culinary tradition. Wait one moment, Germs, I know you're going to say, Oh, in England schmeckt das Essen gar nicht. First of all, it's not true, but then just take a look at what we eat. Both countries, it's like a thousand and one things you can do with a dead pig, plus potatoes, plus some kind of green vegetables, plus more potatoes. I mean, we concentrate on the differences and we say stuff like, Oh my God, look what those Germans put on their chips. French fries, 
pommes. Look what those Germans put on their chips. Mayonnaise, how weird. And then on the other side, Ugh, guck mal was die hier Engländer auf die Pommes tun. Essig. Ugh. But the fact that we're talking about little differences about what we put on our chips, and I mean, the Dutch and the Belgians are also in there with us with being world champions at eating French fries. But it just goes to show that we've got a common point of departure, just some common ground. You know, we, another point where, where we talk about um, where we talk about the difference is always like, oh, the English they drink their strange warm beer, and all the, oh, the Germans they just drink fizzy lager. But we're talking about splitting hairs here. The English and the Germans have massive brewing traditions. They've got their own specific ways of brewing. But we're big beer drinkers, you know, we really have got a common culinary tradition just as Northern and Central Europeans. It's just the way it is. And I'm going to get a little bit more serious with this. And there is a bit of a serious point to this video. And um, I'm going to address the point that we have a very similar political and social and even religious tradition. Now, I'm not a religious person by any means, but we do have to acknowledge that the UK and Germany have the same majority religions in that we have Christianity as the main religion and we have even have the two strains of it so we have the Catholic and the Protestant or evangelical strains of um, Christianity as our main religions and also just the the fact that we live in Europe the area which really wasn't a concept for a long time but before there was a concept of Europe as one uniform geographical area there was a concept of Christendom the Christian countries and that was pretty much the area of Europe before we of course went off conquering lots of countries and forcing Christianity on other people but that's a whole other chapter but yes we are part of this Christendom we have a society which is acknowledged as having Judeo-Christian beliefs we have a similar similar political society we have a society which is based on liberal democracy pluralism and freedom of expression we have the same political traditions the concept of left and right socialism to fascism and everything in between economic liberalism economic intervention by the state the welfare state all these common european political traditions i mean at international level we even have official cooperations between our parties our political traditions and our societies are so close that we were able to form part of this one massive social and political project known as the eu and are both members of this m huge project now uh, Richie, what, what, what? Das mit der EU <coughs> vorbei jetzt, ne? Ihr seid weg. What do you mean? We, we, we've gone. Ach, lieber Richie. <sighs> okay, fair enough. Brexit is a negative example of how we share traditions because obviously the UK has gone its own strange way when it comes to leaving the e the EU. But the fact that we did have many years with the close in, um, close connections of the EU we had the alliances at EU parliament level for example the CDU and CSU in Germany um, were part of the same alliance the uh, parliamentary group within the EU, EU parliament as the conservative party for example they call themselves I think the Europe Europe's People's Parties or whatever and then you have on the other side for example the SPD in Germany together with Labour in the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats and even after Brexit these parties continue to be allies with a firm European common basis for their policies. So that was just a brief summary of the evidence then our countries are very very close culturally our societies our politics our food our drink our climate everything they are very similar places in fact i moved from the uk to germany and i can't think of any countries that i consider to be more similar culturally maybe you could argue that some of the english-speaking colonies like the usa or new zealand australia or those places are maybe closer to the uk in that we have a, a shared language exactly the same shared language but there's a whole european aspect that they do not share they have their own particular colonial history that we do not share in europe so i think the uk and germany are probably the most 
similar countries that I can think of. Do you agree? Maybe you've got a different opinion. If so, let me know it in the comments down below. And before I go on to the slightly more serious point of this video, I would just like to say thank you very much for watching anyway. And if you are enjoying the video so far, please remember to give me a thumbs up. And if you haven't done so, done so already, please consider subscribing to the channel. I would love to have you on board. Now I'm going to turn now more to my own personal story and also to the question of why for me integration, despite all the comments, all the compliments being very, very flattering, keeping it real, why integration into German society for me was indeed rather quite easy compared to the fate of others and why it should really not be overstated how well or less well I have done because I came from a real position of privilege. First of all, I came over as a student on part of an exchange scheme. This was part of an EU scheme, of course, which will be a bit more difficult for future generations of British students, I imagine. But I came over, I was studying German in the UK and I had to do a year out. It was not um, exactly the um, Erasmus scheme that um, I think is in place nowadays that helps you study at um, universities abroad, but it was a very similar um, exchange program. And it meant first and foremost that I had an in instant access to a placement at a school where I was working. And it also gave me a grant, a grant that I didn't have to pay back. I didn't have to take any loans or anything like that, but EU money that gave me it was around 1,000 marks every month just to live and I had some very um, reasonably priced student accommodation to live in. I had more than enough money to live off and I was free to live without worry. And of course when I came over I already had a good solid basis of the language. I didn't come over not being able to speak the local language. In fact the problem I had as somebody who came over specifically wanting to learn German was actually trying to convince other people not to speak English with me because most people that I met, a lot of people that I met at the start wanted to practice their English with me and probably thought also they were doing me a favour by speaking English. So you really have to look at the situation and say that was absolute, an absolute privilege. Everybody's second language here is, is English and basically being having the, the, the chance, the, the sheer look of being born in an English speaking country and having English as the international language all over the world, it really does make life a lot easier for you. So I had financial stability, a roof over my head, a job to go to, all the structures of this EU exchange program, people looking after me. I also had no problems with the language because I came from a privileged position of having spoken some of the language and speaking the international language of English anyway. At all times I also had a safety net in that I had a home to go back to in the UK if I wanted. I could have gone back to the UK at any time. I th suppose this the same still applies now. The, the sa safety net is there. I can go back to my family at any time. If things go wrong in Germany for whatever I can return to another relatively rich country where I have um, the structures of a family and friends. Also in general I think attitudes the attitudes of German people, people living in Germany, to the British, to the English is largely very, very positive. To speak very much in general terms, the Germans are very fond of the English. They think we are slightly crazy, slightly nuts, but in general, I mean, particularly with the Brexit thing nowadays, some of the respect has maybe been lost, but in general, they think we're great. They like our music, like our popular culture, um, very much see us as, as very um, close close relations I think in, in Europe and as I say a lot of people are very interested in English culture, British culture, speak the language and are very open so my welcome was always very very positive. I remember also mentioning at some point very early on to a friend of mine referring to myself as a foreigner, um, the specific term Ausländer and he said to be honest, I mean, it's technically right, you are from the Ausland, from another country, from another state, but nobody here will really refer to you as Ausländer because that is a term more reserved for ethnic groups that aren't of the same ethnic groups and everybody is just so open and welcoming to the British anyway and that is 
correct. It's not necessarily right, but he was absolutely right. I was never really a real Ausländer. Another thing which you may have thought could have been difficult for me coming from another country to Germany, which is known as the land of certificates and permits, Bescheinigung, Zertifikate. You need a, an official document for pretty much everything, especially when it comes to qualifications. You're not allowed to um, pursue a certain career unless you are qualified, you have a certain um, vocational training, etc. etc. But I also have had the look that I have a, a BA, a Bachelor of Arts degree from a university in the UK and I don't honestly know, to be honest, if um, this is already officially recognised when it comes to um, local authorities or whatever working for the government, government positions or whether I would have to have that um, officially recognised, actually um, stamped and approved here as being um, valid in Germany, but in general, in industry, it is simply accepted. BA, the BA, the Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science, has been pretty much adopted in um, German universities as the um, preferred type of qualification now, rather than the old traditional German qualifications uh, in academia. So in industry, I have found that I have, I've never gone this step and got my thing, uh, my university certificate officially um, recognized I could do I I know the process I'm not entirely sure if it would be necessary but certainly in industry in the private sector it is simply accepted and I think that's a bit of leeway my CV my experience my professional experience especially of course when it comes to translation because the most important um, qualification I have is my mother tongue English but I've also found very much flexible approach and acceptance of my um, academic qualifications here as well. So yes, I have done very well. I have established myself in the country and I feel very much at home here. I'm particularly proud of my standard of German. I have seen other people come to the country under similar in similar circumstances and not quite make the most of it as I have done. But then again, from the start, the very basis for me to have a successful life here in Germany, the ganzen Voraussetzungen, they were in place right from the start. And every now and again, there are certain stories you hear that bring you firmly back to ground and make you feel a little humble and recognize just the privileged situation you are in. And it was this one that I read. I'm going to link a story down below in the description to an article um, to the Nordstadt blogger. It's a a blog um, site here based in the northern part of the city of Dortmund. This is a story of someone who had none of the look, none of the privileges that I had, but has made a real success of his life here in Germany. And I have to say, hats off. It makes me feel really humble. And these are the people that really deserve your compliments and our applause, our admiration. I'm talking in this case, I mean, I have people, we have people in our private um, friend um, circle of friends that have gone through similar things we know more personal stories but I don't know if they want to be featured on my channel and this is a guy who's obviously um, already in the public eye his name is Hikmat Sadiq Badia he came to Dortmund as a refugee in 2009 as an Iraqi Kurd fleeing from one of the most this is just a quick summary please do read the article if you have time because um, it's very interesting and if you have time and if you also speak German of course it's in German he this is a guy fleeing from northern Iraq in 2009 it's a time around the end of the third Gulf War when the Americans were withdrawing their troops and it left the Kurdish areas of um, Iraq exposed to bombing by the Turkish military there were two years um, in his home region two years of bombing from the Turkish military um, supposedly targeting PKK um, emplacements. This guy was fleeing a war zone, and not only a war zone, but a war zone in a completely other part of the country. He came over and um, he received what is known as a, a duldung, um, as a refugee. And after a night in Cologne, he came straight to um, Dortmund. Um, duldung would be um, an exceptional leave to remain in uh, English legal language. In German residency law, that it actually states it's a vorübergehende Aussetzung der Abschiebung, so a, per, a temporary delay of 
expulsion from the country for somebody who has actually no right to be there. It's while they check out whether you actually have a right to asylum. So first of all, you've got none of the legal basis. He's, I, I came from another EU state. I came, people gave me money to come over here to carry on with my studies. He's coming from another part of the world where he speaks no German. He speaks another native language, which is certainly not a Germanic language, comes over basically fleeing violence. Not like me from one safe region to another safe region being paid to do so, but basically coming over here and having to prove that he has a right to seek asylum here. He came over here and in his home country in the autonomous region of Kurdistan where he was living, he was pretty much considered a qualified hairdresser. And qualified is a relative term because the area where he's from doesn't have the same system of um, Ausbildung, um, vocational qualifications or any kind of qualifications, but he'd been cutting hair from the age of 13 and was pretty much an established hairdresser. And he's over here and what happens whilst you've got this status as refugee, you are not allowed to work. You have no work permits and you wouldn't have been able to work anyway. So he had to st start from scratch, go back to school, the stark contrast with me, I've got my degree over in, in the UK and I come over and I could easily get it recognised, but I haven't really had, had to because even in Germany, in this, this, this country of certificate, certificates, permits, um, official documents, I nev I've never been um, requested to do so, never needed to do so in the private sector. And here he is, he has to start from scratch a young man. In his first three years he first of all learnt German, got his German to a B1 level which is a feat in itself and then took uh, part-time work working in civil engineering and went back to school, went back to secondary school, school to complete his leave certificate and then they did so between 2009 and 2012, leaving in 2012 with, with his leave certificate and then from there he could then start and get an official qualification to work as a hairdresser. The next th uh, three years were dedicated to getting that qualification as a hairdresser all the time, still with this duldung, with this exceptional leave to remain. So not really knowing whether he's going to be allowed to stay in the country permanently or not. I'm trying as best as I can to summarize his story as quickly as possible, but I find it very difficult. As you can tell, I find it a really inspiring story do read the article, it, it, you won't regret it. It's a fascinating story. After him being, being qualified as a hairdresser, he then works in a salon here in the northern part of the city in Germany. So he's, he's in work all the time, not knowing whether he's going to be expelled from the country, sent back to northern Iraq. And in fact, I've brought this up um, now because the, in the article it states that the September of this year, so last month, was a key date because all the time he's been dreaming of setting up his own salon. Now, this is where the um, German mentality of having to have a certificate for everything comes into play. You cannot open your own hairdressing salon in Germany without your what's known as Meister brief. You have to be a Meister, you have to be a master. There are um, two levels of qualification you can qualify for a specific vocation, um, which is a normal Ausbildung, uh, but after that you can take it to an advanced level, which is the, the master level. For many jobs, this is the requirement to open your own business, and certainly in the hairdressing profession, you need to be a Meister to open your own salon. And he is, of course, then faced by the problem that if you are not a permanent resident in the country, i.e. you only have this exceptional leave to remain, you cannot attend the Meisterschule, the master school. You cannot go on to, to this level of education. And September, I think, marked the end of a period where, and he is now a, a entitled, because he's lived here for so long, to uh, some kind of residency permit. Um, it's not a permanent residence, but it is certainly a guaranteed two-year period. It's a long time since I've done it. I can't remember which one is the permanent one, which one is the the temporary one, I think it is the Aufenthaltserlaubnis that is for two years and then after that you can apply for an Aufenthaltsgenehmigung. As I say, these are all the privileges that, that I had that I didn't have to deal with. By the time I came over, we had 
instantly as EU citizens we had instant the instant right to uh, Aufenthaltsgenehmigung, so permanent right of residence in the country. And this guy has been slogging away for over 10 years, saving his money, working, putting himself through school, hours and hours at the um, Aus Auf Ausländerbehörde. I think reading the article, I think he's al already used his savings to take that next step and obtain his own salon. He must be working with another Friseurmeister, someone who has got the master title. I'm not entirely sure, but I th think things look good. And I just have to say, I take my hat off to this kind of people and it really does make me feel humble. I don't want you to misunderstand me. I really do welcome all the compliments and I am still proud of my achievements here. But it's things like these, stories like this, and believe me, these stories are, this story is not unique. This is one of many. These are the success stories that you never hear about in the press. Well, thanks to Nord, Nordstadt Blogger, we, we do. As I say, these types of story really make me feel humble. This for me is the story of a genuine integration hero. I had a lot of privilege. I had it easy compared to him. Hats off to Hikmat. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found the video as interesting as I did. I found it uh, researching and preparing it for you. If you did enjoy it, please remember to give me a thumbs up and also consider subscribing to the channel. At this point, I would also like to thank my patrons. Those are the people that support me on Patreon. If you think you are interested in seeing some of the exclusive content over there and would maybe like to support this channel further, check out the link in the description down below. Otherwise, I will see you here on YouTube as ever. Thanks very much for watching. Macht's gut, Leute!